All right, my friends, welcome to today's awesome seminar series. My name is Dwayne Spires. And I'm Lauren Spires. And we are your summer camp and after school program experts with success team coaching. And today we have a super awesome, incredible special guest to bring you. This is one of our mentors, one of our uh, just people who's really made an impact with their work in our lives. And I know that he's made an impact in your lives. So if you are excited, if you're ready to jump into this seminar, I want you to get into that chat section right now. Give me a big Y-E-S, a bunch of exclamation points, and let's get this party started. Yes. Are you excited or what? Oh yeah, I'm super pumped up. So we've got our coaches on the line. We've got our whole team on the line. We've got Super Chris on the camera. What's up, Super Chris? Hey. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just want to share with you about uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy. So Ben Hardy is a awesome author. He's an entrepreneur. He's a family man. He's not the guy that just has one or two kids, right. not just three or four. Right. He has like six kids. But like six kids. <laughs> so for those of you that have children and you're like, how do we juggle life? How do we juggle success? How do we bring it all together? He's the man to watch because he's doing it. All right, so I'm gonna bring Benjamin Hardy on the line here. Give me one second. All right, it's gonna ask you to unmute and let's get you on here. How are you doing today, man? It is a pleasure to have you. Yeah, very happy to be with you. Thanks for thanks for letting me come. Absolutely, man. So we've got a, a lot of questions here and we have a ton of people that are ready to dive deep into some of your work mm -hmm. your books um, you've made such a huge impact in their lives so not only are we excited to have you today but also for everybody that's joining us at the 2023 e3 success summit you're going to be one of our headlining speakers and we're pumped to have you there as well yeah. yep looking forward awesome. to it right. looking forward yeah. to being with you in person absolutely absolutely all right so we want to start off with a very serious question. What was your childhood favorite TV show? <laughs> mm, uh, probably Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You, I think you just won points with everybody in this entire audience. <laughs> All right, one, one other question. Very serious one. You're sitting down for chicken wings. Hot, medium, or mild? Ooh, medium. Okay. Medium. All right, we got you. Now we know who you are as a man. Exactly. All right. <laughs> and did we have that right? You have six kiddos, right? Yes, we have six kids. Ages uh, two to 15. Two to 15. So you got the whole spectrum. That's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump right in. I know everybody's super pumped. And um, the first question that we have, this goes around the book, Who Not How. Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to that book for the first time. I was with our media director. We call him Super Chris. And we're driving in somewhere like North Carolina. Mm -hmm. We were going to go visit one of our member schools. And every five minutes, you would say something in that book, and he would turn to me and just give me this dead stare as if you were talking into my soul. And I knew at that point, I was like, I got to read and listen to everything that you write because it's legit. So, well, And what, actually, what's funny about that, too, is is when they were out of town, I was back home. So we, we have three kids ourselves as well. And I was with the kids, and he calls me and he goes, hey, listen, I need you to start this book so that we are 100% on the same page because we're about yeah. to be uh, doing some shifting around and uh, I, we, need to, we need to make sure that we're on the same page. And so I was like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> That's definitely been a huge help. Yeah. And one of the questions that we have, and this is, this is going to be for basically anybody that's watching this live with us or the replay is when you're working with entrepreneurs specifically, like small business owners, who are some of the like level one, kind of the first who's? that they should bring on the team? Like, what are some of those who's that really make the most impact once they start entertaining this concept? All right, so this is level one who's? Yeah, this would be like, if they've never brought somebody on, they've never delegated, they've never empowered anybody to kind of help them out with anything, and they're okay. just breaking the ice. Yeah, so this would be like a, like probably, you know, this is very Tim Ferriss-ish, you know, but like I'd start getting digital assistants as fast as you can, even just one to take care of as many logistical tasks as you can. And this would like the upgraded, the level two or three version of this would be taking on like a new CEO or a new leadership team, like a what, what EOS would call an integrator so that you can fully back off as a leader. But that's maybe like a few steps down the road. But yeah, I think a first two is probably get everything logistical off your plate, emails, schedule, 
um, various to do's that are just going on in your life and start letting them organize you so that you stop trying to organize yourself. It probably Ooh. offloads yeah. um, hundreds of daily decisions, you know, and from like a, a mental standpoint, decision fatigue means the more decisions you make in a day, the less flow you'll have, the more your performance just drops. And so if you've just offloaded, call it 20 hours a week, but also hundreds of decisions a day, you can go deeper into what you're good at. I love what you just said about having them organize you. Right. That's a golden nugget to write down. Yeah, I think well, when you, you hit the nail on the head when you said decision fatigue, like there will be times like at this point now we have like our dinner schedule pretty much mapped out like what's going to happen every single night. But there would be times where I'd be like, babe, what do you want to have for dinner? And he's like, I can't even make a decision right now. Just make something for Yeah, me. you hit the end of that road, right? And you're just like, I can't. I can't do it. Make any more decisions today. Right. I'm done. My brain yep. stopped working. Yep. <laughs> so, I think one other, just real quick, one other would be um, the faster you can start teaming with people like as an example just this is straight up serious um so this is like five years ago i i was already a massive blogger uh, i had a huge email list but i was i i was still making like literally very low like very low six figures and just by collaborating with someone in this case it was someone who was better at marketing and funnels with my current position, I immediately jumped to seven figures just because I was immediately working with someone who already had niche skills that I could use. So like you're already you're already better than you think at what you're doing. You're just not partnered with someone who can actually help you get there. And so, you know, that that was a big one for me. It was just I, I only had one assistant at that time. And then I started collaborating with this marketing guy who I got to know. And immediately with no change in my marketing, like no change in like my positioning. I immediately went up to seven figures, like 10x, like 10x I immediately. It. I love it. Now, in that process, you had to become somebody new. When we talk about, you know, the psychology of like identity, for example. And we work with, you know, school and studio owners. We've got gym owners who are used to doing everything themselves. Yes. Right? They're the ones, you know, cleaning the facility, teaching the classes. Changing the light bulbs, answering the phones. Trying to do sales, trying to do marketing. And then they hear us talk about finding the right who's. Um, but the interesting part, and Ben, I'm going to have to unmute you again. Um, I just did a mute all. Uh, to block it. Yeah, there we go. Um, where do you see or or why does it exist where some people can just jump right in with this concept and then some people almost have like this inherent resistance to stepping outside of their comfort zone and trying this on for the first time? Like, why do you think that resistance happens? Um, primarily, it's a few things. One is that you have a fear. Well, if, number one, you actually have an inflated perspective of your own skills. Like you actually think that you can do things better than other people, which is not true. You hire some, some assistant to do something. They're going to organize you 10 times better than you can organize yourself. And you don't need to hire someone for like, you could, could honestly, you could start finding someone for like 10 to 15 bucks an hour, you know, if it, yeah. depending on where they live in the world, you know, but so that, that first one is just that you have an inflated perspective of the fact you think you're good at everything, even though you're actually just good at a very few things. Um, so that's one. The second one is just over sense of control that you're afraid to give off control and let someone else do it. Uh, and this is where you actually shift from self leadership to true leadership, which is where you can actually start empowering other people. This is not you managing. Seriously, you're not trying to be a manager, you're being an, a leader. And so you're giving someone's very specific objectives and goals and you're letting them autonomously manage themselves. There's actually a theory in psychology. It's one of the top motivation theories. It's called self-determination theory. And basically, in order to have self-determination, which is high motivation, you need three things. One is competence, meaning you're, you can do it, you're good at what you're doing. The second one is autonomy, where you can do it the way you want to, how you want to, when and where you want to. And then the third one is relationships, just connection where you, you feel like a connection in what you're doing. So you, this is where you actually shift to being a leader. This is an identity shift where you're no longer just doing all this stuff by yourself. But like you're actually offloading and you're giving people trust to fully take over stuff for you. And, and then you just learn how to have good communication and good follow-up and feedback. But you, you, you start really freeing your mind and just watching the results happen. So I think people are afraid. 
uh, afraid of losing control. They think that stuff will start falling apart. Um, one final reason is just that financially they look at it backwards. They think that making these types of investments is a cost. Like they think, oh, if I, if I'm investing, you know, 15 or 20 bucks or 50 or a hundred bucks in this person or giving this person now 20% of my revenue, whatever it is, they think that that's like, they just look at the downside of that rather than actually appreciating that if they make this investment, number one, they're actually investing in themselves by freeing themselves up so that they can go really deep on what they can do. It also, when you make the investment, you elevate your identity. You really do because then you start actually finding new and better ways to actually start applying your best self yeah. to better situations. So people look at it financially wrong. Um, they're afraid to make the commitment and become a leader and they overinflate how good they think they are at certain things. Gotcha. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting too, is I, I've said this in front of a lot of our members before when you're in the right room and by what I mean by the right room is like a room full of just high level performers that are pulling you up. Like you feel like you're the dumbest person in the room in those rooms, which is a good room <laughs> to be in. Right. One thing that I've discovered is that they actually will talk about their amount of payroll and they'll talk about the size of their team. And it's almost like a like a badge of honor. They're like, look at this awesome team that we have. Look at how much we're investing in them. And I love being in rooms like that. Whereas you go and you kind of go to the opposite end of the spectrum with uh, you know a group of like mom and pop style business owners. They do see payroll as only an expense. Right. And even if they do force themselves to finally hire that one who, they micromanage them. It's like yep. they, they can't let go. Mm -hmm. So I love what you just said about that. Yeah, letting go of control allows that next level to appear and really empowering that team and letting them be autonomous lets that next level appear in business. Right. Now, when, when that next level does appear, it's easy to be in the game. Mm -hmm. When we struggle with seeing the next level, it's easy to fall into the gap. Mm -hmm. So if we can kind of talk about the gap and the gain, which... What a phenomenal book. Thank you for putting that out into the world. Um, if you guys that are watching this right now have read The Gap in the Game, jump into that chat section. Give me a big Y-E-S. I want uh, Ben to be able to see this. Yeah, you've got a lot of fans here. So, so Well, one of the things that you were talking about is like the fear of letting go of that control. So the fear of letting go of that control can come from one of two things. One is that, you know, either the person is going to not do it as well as they think or maybe this is even something internally that they're going, I don't want somebody else to see that I'm not as good at doing these things. And so there's like, it's like two different types of fear that can occur during that yeah. time that can cause people to be even resistant to that. What's a good, what would, Ben, what would you say is a good way that they can just be conscious of the concept of that fear and how to get through it? Well, I think that, and this is kind of more related to the book I'm writing right now, which is called 10X is Easier Than 2X. Um, like a big aspect of this this concept right here is the 80-20 principle, which is that 20% of what you do creates 80% of your results. And so the idea here is, is that there's very few things that you do that first off give you excitement, energy, flow. They're also the things that are most core to who you are and they terrify you the most. They're the things you probably avoid. And then therefore you go into that 80% of things that only creates 20% of your results. And so I think for me, I know that I probably need a who or just to eliminate something if I'm spending a lot of time in that 80%. And I know I'm in that 80% because my attention is all over the place. I'm busy, I'm not effective. And so like the, the more you take seriously that you actually can become really brilliant at something and that you becoming really brilliant is gonna be key to getting amazing results and also being happy, you don't want your time so fragmented. You actually want bigger and bigger spa like spans of time where you can go deeper and deeper rather than just being so busy and shallow. And so I think if you're very busy and you're doing many, many things, different styles or different forms of tasks rather than just doing a few things and going very deep on those, that's a pretty huge evidence that you probably need some who's and that you're, you're spreading yourself thin, you're burning yourself out. And honestly, just by getting one or two who's it, it, you just slow yourself, you, you know, you slow everything down and eventually you actually start to empower your who's your team to do the same, where your team starts becoming more and more capable. Like recently, as an example, like my core assistant recently just hired her own assistant um, because the, like we were, <laughs> we were like, we're growing, in, we're growing in certain ways yeah. and her role started to get way too big because there's certain areas, first off, that she likes the most. 
Um, those would be her 20%, right? And and then there were certain things that she was dropping the ball on now because I was pushing her in a certain direction. And so she was starting to drop things. And so she ultimately clarified her own 80%, the things that she's she's still doing, but doing terribly. And also they're just not that exciting to her. And she formed a new role for that. And she went out and found a who to take over her 80% for herself. Um, and so, I mean, obviously I hired them, but I didn't even interview them. Like, I, like I just said, you, you find your own who, and this is what Dan Sullivan would call a self multiplying or self expanding team. And it happens when you just start letting the team manage themselves and you just, you give them leadership, you give them vision and your vision's big enough and exciting enough that they, they want to be a part of it. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, what I took away from that is busy doesn't equal success. Right. But efficiency can equal success and it should equal success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And staying busy is something that I think we've been just raised to do. You know, we've been we've been taught that in academia. It's like you got to look busy. You got to look like you're doing something. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're going to get in trouble. And in the business world, it's easy to stay busy, especially with social media. It's it's easy to go to a bunch of events. It's a you know, we call them like seminar junkies, like people that just jump around, but they don't actually get the work done. They read so many books, they go to so many events, but they never, ever take action. So it's like, guys, let's stick to a plan, right? Just read Ben's books and take action and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> let me give you events. one more. Let me, let me give you one more. And this is a gut check. This is a, yeah. this, is, this is a, you know, I love the quote. This is an Alcoholics Anonymous quote, Bill, Bill W. But he said, all progress starts by telling the truth. One way that you can know that you probably need a who is just admittedly, if you're not getting the results you want. Like this is, this is just as simple as that. Like who, going for how, if you're just doing more and more how, you might be just kind of the whole idea of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. If you're not making the progress that you want to be making in certain directions, whatever that may be, you know, for me, it might be book sales, right? For me, it could, you know, you all, we all have our own goals if you're an entrepreneur. And just admittedly, if you're not progressing very quickly, it's because you don't have the right who's that will help you get those results. And so you do need new, you know, you need who's that will that have the capability, the skills, the knowledge that you don't have, or just can bring more to the table because you're just too spread thin. So yeah, uh, who's are where you start getting better results. And it, it's a demonstration to yourself that you're committed to getting bigger and better results. I love it. It is a commitment to yourself. And that's one of the things that we, we really talk about quite a bit is walking the talk. Mm -hmm. So as a, as business coaches and we have our members that are tuning in right now, they've made an investment to be in our coaching program. Mm -hmm. And we just made a very large investment to be in a much bigger coaching program for ourselves as well. So getting the right who's on the team, mm -hmm. even as coaches is a massive game changer. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's talk about the gap in the game for a second. Yes. So when things are great, it's easy to be in the game. Um, we're happy, we're excited, we're pumped up. But then when things aren't great, people jump into this gap mindset and they tend to get stuck. So can you just give the audience an overview of the difference between the gap and the gain? And then how do we get out of the gap if we find ourselves there? Yeah, just so you all know, I freaking wrote the book. And I was in the gap so hard. Uh, I go in the gap regularly. You know, like the, one thing that's really, one thing that I think is important is that um, it's a decision. So like one thing that I love about any of Dan Sullivan's models um, is just that they're, they're dichotomies, right? You either go who or how, right? And if you want to stay in the how world, um, you're very limited, right? And so going the who world doesn't mean you don't do any hows. It just means that this is your new orientation towards life. It's a process that you're going to get better and better at. So the gap and the gain is the same way. The gap is is very destructive. It's, it's psychologically, um, it just wears you down. It stresses you out. It makes you feel like you're a loser no matter what you've done. It, it, it stops you from actually seeing where you are and what you've done. And basically what it is, is you're in the gap when you're measuring yourself against some external ideal. That ideal could be where you wish you were. That ideal could be some other person that you're comparing yourself against. Whatever it is, you're measuring yourself against something outside of you. And, and the outside world is constantly changing. And so are your ideals. Like how Dan Sullivan explains it is, is that ideals are like a horizon in the desert. They provide perspective. They provide you know, guidance on maybe where you should walk forward. But no matter how many steps forward you take, there's always going to, you're never going to reach the horizon. It's always going to be out there. And so if you're always measuring yourself against ideals, which by nature are constantly moving and changing, 
then you're never going to actually feel like you're making any progress. That's the gap. And um, this happens all the time. Um, even, even when you've practiced being in the game, and the game is really a twofold concept. The game is where you stop measuring yourself against anything external. You're no longer playing finite games out there. You're only playing the infinite game inside, which means you're only measuring yourself against yourself. Me, Benjamin Hardy, I am not competing with anyone else. Like there's no one else that's on my path. There's no one else that has my past. There's no one else who has my future. So I'm only measuring myself against me where I was before. That's actually the only way you can actually know how far you've come is by measuring your progress backwards. So that's the first aspect of the concept is, is that you're only measuring yourself backwards. And it's interesting. I actually literally, I, I did this this morning, actually, because I was pretty in the gap this morning. I'm very much taking on really powerful, big, exciting challenges. And, and when you're in the midst of, you know, trying to go to your own next level, obviously it can be very overwhelming, right? It can be, if it can be difficult, you're emotional. Can we say that the gap is part of going to the next level? Um, I think that, I don't think you can escape going into the gap. I think it's human. Um, I don't think that the gap is required for seeing a bigger picture future. Okay. I think that, I think, I think you could be in the gain and at the same time have massive ambitions. Um, but I don't think there's, I don't, I mean, at the same time, when you go into the gap, it's a good opportunity to, to kind of, you know, it's kind of like if you, if you're hurt, right. If you're hurt, rather than ignoring it, it's like a good opportunity to look at what's going on and then you can start to stitch it up and fix it, right? Like trauma, as an example, like rather than ignoring the pain. So I think the gap can shed a light um, on what's going on, but ultimately it won't, it, it, it can't really help you beyond that. The only thing you can do from there is like actually turn the experience into a positive, like actually learn from it, dissect it, don't avoid it. You know, one problem with being in the gap is, is that it tends to lead you to avoiding the hard truth. Um, whereas with, if you're in the gain, you shift over to an approach mindset and you just, you face it dead on, call it, it's a trauma. Say it's something you went through in your past, right? Um, you actually face it and then you transform the experience into learning and growth into lessons. That's what psychologists would call post-traumatic growth. So that's really the second aspect. The first aspect is just, you just measuring yourself backwards. Yeah. The second aspect is, is that every experience you have moving forward, you value, you don't devalue your experience, even if it was an experience you hated, even if it was an experience that hurt, you don't devalue any of your experiences. You are the only one who has access to your experiences. All 122 people on this call are having a different experience right now. You all have, you're all seeing a very different experience and no one has access to your experiences. I don't have access to your experiences. You don't have access to my experiences. And so the question now becomes, what do I do with my experiences? Do I devalue them because they weren't what I wanted them to be because they were painful? Or do I truly treasure them and do I turn them into gains? Do I actually like squeeze the juice out of them? Meaning I control my experiences. They don't control me. And when you're in the gain, you transform every experience into more and more and more gains. It's like mining out gold and gems and precious. And so you can do that on a daily basis. You just look back on today or even this phone call. It's like, what, what did I actually get out of that? And actually you start learning more and more from every experience. And this is how you start getting way better. So the gain actually helps you become much better and it helps you run your own race. The moment that we catch ourselves in the gap, what are like one or two steps, just instant kind of quick tips that you would give to get out of the gap? Yeah. I mean, for me, um, first off, you can just tell because you're feeling terrible. If you're feeling terrible, it's probably because you're measuring yourself against some ideal or you're, you're looking at your life or your situation improperly. And you're now thinking that you're, you're somewhere where you shouldn't be. So you can tell because you don't feel good that you're probably assessing yourself or a situation improperly devaluing yourself and where you're at. So I think, I think a helpful step just immediately is just to kind of step out. Um, I honestly just pull out my journal. Uh, I pull out my journal and I just start writing down like, okay, where am I actually at right now? Like, what are some of the things that have happened in the last week or month? Like, what is some of the progress I'm actually making? Because when you're in the gap, you actually stop, you start to kind of destabilize and you start to lose sense of yourself. Like when you're in the game, you get regrounded where you're like, okay, here's where I actually am. And so for me, I, um, I could call a friend, talk about what I'm going through, and then we can, I can reorient myself back to, oh yeah, this is where I'm really at. This is where I'm going. I, I can keep going forward. Uh, or I just, so I call a friend or I just pull out my journal, honestly, and just write awesome. down what's going on with the last week or the last month. And, I, and awesome. then I'm shocked. I'm re-shocked as I look back and I'm like, oh yeah, look at all the things that are actually going on in my life. Like, all of these things would have been crazy to me six months ago or a year ago. Yeah. And I'm totally not paying attention 
to my own progress because I'm overwhelmed by my goals um, or I'm overwhelmed by the challenges of this situation or these. And so it re reminds you and it helps you become more mindful. That's like, Oh my goodness. Like, look at all this amazing stuff that wasn't even here five or six months ago. These new challenges and opportunities that I'm dealing with that would have been unfathomable to me very recently. Mm-hmm. We had somebody that just wrote, uh, her name's Abigail. She just said, who, not how, call a friend. <laughs> like That's literally the yeah. concept of finding the right who to right. get out of the gap. Now you're combining uh, concepts together. I love it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> get a who. Get a yeah. who to get you out of the gap. That's a great one. Get that accountability partner, that person that's, you know, been on that journey a few steps ahead of you, a coach, a mentor. That's legit. Yeah, definitely. Good stuff. Now, get you've a, got this other gap. book. Get a, get, a, get a gap who. <laughs> get a gap who. <laughs> yeah, there we go. You should have a lot of those, by the way. That went back to your whole idea of being in environments. Like, yeah. you should have a lot. It's best to have tons of people like that that immediately get you out of the gap. Well, can we talk about that for a second? So, the... Uh, the concept of creating an environment that allows you to win is very powerful. And when we talk about environment, it can be a lot of different things, including people. Can you chat about your recommendation on selecting a top five or a top 10? Like who should we be surrounding ourselves with to help us stay in the game, to help us keep, you know, in alignment with our future self? Basically, who can we be around that'll help us win? Yeah. I think that those that those five or 10 are going to be rotating. Some of them are going to be consistent from call it jump to jump to jump. There's there's probably three. I mean, I'm talking really close. I mean, obviously, yeah. I've got like my parents who I call and stuff like that. But like I'm talking like inner circle, like you call them and like these could be accountability partners or friends or like collaborators or mentors. I think that that's kind of like a five to 10 group. Uh, I think there's a few characteristics and this, these, these, these people will rotate. And as you keep advancing, these people are going to become very interesting. And sometimes people will come in and out, right? Um, they, they serve different purposes. Um, but ultimately these people help support your future self and they're very excited about your future self. And they're people you can be radically honest with about your own challenges, but also your goals. Like, uh, as an example, I have a, a friend who I spoke with yesterday. He's been kind of part of that circle, I guess you could say for almost 10 years. Um, and he and I, we we usually talk once a week, just for 30 minutes, just regular calls. Um, but yesterday I was even still shocked at how honest he was being with me and how honest I was being with him about literally what I'm going through, some of my own struggles, uh, but also my own ambitions and dreams, like what I actually truly want and I'm going for, which I would probably not be as blunt and open and honest about with most people. Um, so that's one, but I think also people who, who increasingly become collaborators with you. Like one of the ones, one of the people who's kind of embedded himself into call it my like big five or big 10 circle is actually my financial advisor. Um, but he's someone who, um, he's not a typical financial advisor. He's very much like a pure entrepreneur. Uh, and he's always just blowing my mind. Like he is super inspiring to me. Um, and so every time I talk to him, it's like the the cobwebs like fall off my eyes a little bit. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm re-reminded of lots of truths that I already know, you know? And so I think that it's it's important to just be around people who who are supportive of your goals, maybe a part of them. Like he's, I would consider him a part of my team, even though he's like not really an employee. He's more of like a collaborator slash extended team member. Um, yeah, just people who either you can talk to and confide in, but also increasingly people who are extensions of your team that are like moving forward with you. So- as you create your future self, how important is it for you to really enroll everybody that's in your circle into sharing that future self vision? You know, because if I have this, you know, aha moment and this breakthrough and this transformation and I and I just really connect with this new version of a future self that I'm I'm growing into, but then I go home and everybody treats me like who I am today or even worse who I was in the past, it kind of will pull me down. So how important would you say it is to the audience to just surround yourself not only with awesome people but say hey this is where i'm going and like be open and transparent about your future self radically honest as you put it yeah yeah i think it's super important so like i I equate it to so identity would be the inside where your identity is shifting and you're becoming more and more clear on what you care about what you want what you're committed to and so that's on the inside what what would be kind of the equivalent of that on the outside would be 
quote unquote, the word would be standards. Like standards is a weird term, but it's, it's your description of how, of, of kind of what you care about and what you're going for. And, and so telling people about what you're going for and what you care about and ultimately how you want to be related to is really important. Like as an example, and as you grow and honestly, as you're in the game more, you'll learn more from your experiences and you'll clarify and update your standards. And your standards are just what you care about. It's what you prioritize. It's the level with which you kind of want to live your life in a specific certain way. And no, this going back to the gap in the game, there's no point in comparing your standards with anyone else. Like these are your standards. <laughs> this is what you care about. You know, as an example, like I want to keep writing more and more books, but this, this may not be relevant to you, right? And so like you care about what you care about. But as you kind of clarify and specify like standards, call it for a team, right? Like, or even, even for me, like as someone who like speaks, like, right, like I might lay out like this must be true now in order for an opportunity to make sense for me, right? So by, because I've clarified my standards and what I'm looking for, the right people, the right who's can say, yeah, that fits with us as well. Um, but you can also retrain your team. Like as an example, like my, my assistant and I work constantly in the game. We make mistakes all the time. And then we use that to clarify new standards and systems. And it's like, all right, based on what we just had, this is now part of the protocol. This is what we're doing. So I think it can become a continuous process, not like a once every six or eight months or 10 months, you're like, oh crap, like here's my future self and now everything's got to change. I think it's a continuous kind of, I've heard it said like in basketball that the best basketball teams like on defense, they're constantly talking, constant communication. Like if you were at an NBA game, these guys are screaming at each other all the time. Get that guy, blah, blah, blah. Like they're, when a team is not communicating, like that's when the defense gets hosed right in a basketball setting. And so like, I just think it's a constant iterative process. Like I actually love the quote from uh, Naval Ravikant. Naval Ravikant is an angel investor and he's an entrepreneur, but he said that he said, it's not 10,000 hours that makes uh, an outlier. It's actually 10,000 iterations. And so like, we're always iterating. Like if you talk to me tomorrow, I'm going to be a little bit different than I am today. Like I'll have learned a few things, had some gains, you know, whatever, uh, but I'll see things a little differently and, and what I want will be even a little tweaked. And so it's just constant communication moving forward and constant improvement and adjustment. Yeah. Looking for those 1% improvements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it okay to be real with yourself? Uh, this is more of a hypothetical question, but I would love your take on it. When you realize you've outgrown somebody in that circle and it's time to respectfully distance yourself because there's a lot of people who we see that we've worked with that achieve a great level of success in their after school program their summer camp martial arts studio dance studio whatever they're they're focused on and it's like they they start outgrowing people but they're scared to let go of the people that are trying to hold them back what are your thoughts on that <laughs> it's so big it, it's it's so big um this kind of equates to 10x versus 2x for me. So like, just to give you guys a little example, like, so how, how Dan and Sullivan and I kind of explain this is if you're going for 2x, whatever that means, what that mostly means is that you're letting your past dictate what you're doing in the future. You're kind of going for more linear marginal growth uh, to go 10x. I mean, 2x, most people are, you, you can actually keep that 80%. That 80% of the 820. Yeah, just actually, do more of it and then you'll be at 2x. Yeah, right. yeah you can keep it. You really don't have to change that much. It's, it's more just like minor tweak. Um, and, and so, but if you're wanting to make massive jumps, transform yourself, transform your life, which it appears that everyone in this group, you probably wouldn't be in here if, if you weren't someone seeking, you know, <laughs> Very really, true. Like, right. let's call it exponential, nonlinear, huge growth. Right. Um, what that means is, is that 80% of your current life is going to be irrelevant at that next level 10x wow. future. Um, so, so that also includes clients. It includes collaborators. Um, just look at your life right now. And, and if you looked back five or 10 years ago, how many people in your life five or 10 years ago did you communicate with almost daily or all the time that you have almost no communication with now, yep. right? It's just, right. A, it's organic. Um, and so you're kind of, you, you shift from 10X to 2X when you're trying to keep things as they are. And there's a lot of people who are gonna be around you who are gonna want you to stay the same for their own self-preservation. Um, yep. For one reason or another, you going deep, in, you know, what you want to focus on going all in on that and becoming, you know, making your own jumps and transformation. Um, that's going to, that's going to tweak things for them. And so, um, if your, if your standards are no longer aligned because now you've kind of clarified where you're wanting to go and you've elevated what you want for yourself, their standards aren't there anymore. You were related because you had similar standards in some way. Maybe you guys liked the same music or, you know, like I'm thinking back in high school or whatnot, but like now you're like, you have different values, goals, and ambitions, and they really don't have those. 
And so like your futures are no longer aligned. And so you can continue to um, stay in the relationship because it's based on the past, or you can, I would say kind of Marie Kondo it, you know, and be grateful for what was be in the game, right? Like, she, you know, she says like, be grateful for the clothes you're letting go of because they no longer fit. Um, I'll tell you guys something truthfully, like in writing this last book, I reached a point where I actually was like, I don't know if I want to keep writing this book because I'm not sure if writing books with Dan and Babs is 10X or 2X for me anymore. I've gone through massive change, massive transformation. And so I think it's not everything that's 2X can become 10X, but mm. everything that's 10X can accidentally shift down to 2X. And what that means is, is that you can outgrow things. Um, just because something was a huge transformational relationship in the past doesn't mean that you guys are going in the same direction anymore. Um, yeah. In great situations you want the relationship to continue because that's where compound interest comes, right? The longer something can stay, as long as the, each person's like totally continue to be stoked on a similar future, then you can get massive compounding effects, but that's not always going to be the case. And so then, then just as a last thought on this, um, the sunk cost fallacy, sunk cost fallacy is basically just the idea that because you've invested in something, you hold on to it, even though it's now a bad investment. You know what I mean? Like you watch the first 10 minutes of a movie and you keep watching to the end because you watch the first 10 minutes, right? Like, so Daniel Kahneman, the, he's the Nobel prize winning psychologist who came up with that theory and many others. He says this, and I love it. He says he has no sunk costs. He says the moment he knows something that's different from what he knew before and that reinforms his future, he lets go of the past. No sunk costs. He doesn't yeah. hold on to something just because he invested it in the past whether that's an idea, a relationship, a situation, as soon as he now knows better, he just lets go and he's in the game. He moves on. It's not because the other person's bad. It's because you're going in a different direction. It's time to be at that next level, be a more empowered leader, more evolved leader and change more lives. And, and that's, that's one of the mottos that we have. We want people to change kids' lives. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we're going to shift the world. I love it. And we work with a lot of people who have jumped to this next level of, of financial success and personal success. They've had awesome transformations. They've had these breakthroughs that have really impacted their lives and the people around them. And one of the things that stood out that was really interesting when I was reading Be Your Future Self Now, you identify seven different threats that can derail you from actually being your future self. And one of them in particular this is an interesting one that, that I had to think about and process for a moment, is that success is often the catalyst for failure. So where we see this play out is we'll get these people that'll jump to this next level financially. Everything feels good, right? Like their comfort zone, it's a, it's a very comfortable comfort zone at that level. More money, they have a bigger team, life is good. And then all of a sudden their financial um, gains, they kind of plateau a little bit, even though it's way higher than where they were. And it's almost like they fill their lives with threat number five, which is also a bunch of small goals. So can you elaborate on like how small goals get in the way and also how success can actually get in the way? Yeah. I mean, my, my new mental model for it, just because I'm so deep into a different book would be, this is the equivalent of you've gone 10x and now you've shifted to 2x, which means that now you're letting, you're no longer letting a bigger future dictate what you do, but now you're kind of in autopilot and you're letting the past de determine what you do. Um, yeah, it happens. It happens so much. Um, it ha I think it happens to all of us if we're honest for ourselves, um, where you make a big jump in your life and you actually subconsciously haven't adapted to the new level. Subconsciously, you're actually still more comfortable down here. And so you might accidentally self-sabotage yourself. Like call it, and I've done this <laughs> so many times <laughs> where like financially all of, all of a sudden have way more money than I've ever been used to. And like, I'll find ways to flush it down the toilet. Yeah, real quick. Everybody that's on this line, raise your hand if you've been guilty of that type of pattern. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people raising their hands. I, I like um, Gay Hendricks book, The Big Leap, because he calls this, uh, this the upper limit problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He, and it's just essentially that like, you're now in a new ecosystem, right? And subconsciously, you don't believe you deserve it, right? And so, like, you'll you'll pull yourself back down to, I guess, that emotional that emotional level. They take their foot off the gas, and then the results decline. Yeah, or or honestly, you just run out of future. Like, you actually you um you've 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 kind of reached some level that was beyond what you thought was you were gonna do, and now you stop, you know 
to threat number one's point, right? You stop having a bigger picture future that's giving your life meaning and giving you grit, resilience, uh, what Viktor Frankl would call spiritual strength. So what Frankl said is, is what we need is not a tensionless state, but rather the striving and struggling for a worthwhile goal. And so if you've reached some, as you were saying, comfortable place where it's now tensionless, right? Um, if you don't have the, it, it, it's really crazy. It's really interesting that dig, the more you dig into like the, the psychological research, your, your view of your own future is actually your anchor in the present. And once you stop having a bigger future, your present destabilizes. And this is exactly what happened for, for the people in um, the concentration camp. Yeah. Like your in order to be anchored in the present, you need a purpose, a calling, some purpose, some goal that gives your life meaning and, <laughs> and, and gives you something to do. And when you lose that, um, that's why a lot of people like literally never want to retire um, because it's some, you know, why get to a point where you're no longer actually charging that brain, transforming your brain, um, like continually learning and growing. We kind of need that. I actually have to share a quote. Uh, this is a, an amazing quote from Robert Green in his book, Mastery. I just want to read this quote. It says this. He says, anything that is alive is in a continual state of change and movement. The moment that you rest Thinking that you have attained the level you desire, a part of your mind enters a phase of decay. You lose your hard-earned creativity and others begin to sense it. This is a power and intelligence that must be continually renewed or it will die. And I've seen this. I've just seen if you're not, if you're not operating toward a, a bigger future, and honestly, in order to be in a flow state, you need three things. There's three core preconditions of flow. One is clear and specific goals. If you don't have clear and specific goals, it's very hard to know where to focus your attention. The second one is immediate feedback. That if you're not getting regular feedback, which is another form of learn, another word for learning, mm -hmm. then you're not continually making those iterations, and you're not you're not constantly updating and changing and getting better at what you do. Um, one uh, one other important aspect of immediate feedback is risk. That it can be scary putting yourself out there and trying something that might might fail. This is why they've really studied um, flow and high performance sports is because there's immediate feedback. There's high consequence for failure. And so you want to be continually exercising courage and trying things where you're getting feedback and emotionally exposing yourself and learning and having consequences to your actions. The third one is skills to um, challenge ratio that you want to constantly be doing things that are outside your current skill and knowledge level or else you're kind of just plateaued. You're just doing stuff on autopilot. You already know how to do this. This is habitually, that's really boring, really bad for the brain. So you always want to be doing stuff that's a, either a little or a lot beyond what you've done before because then it really activates flow. You really got to like focus, learn, and adapt. And, and, and so if you're not doing those things, you're essentially decaying and dying. Gosh, we were just talking about that mm -hmm. at the VIP day. We are. Like yep. how systems over time just naturally decay. Yep. You've got to keep moving forward. I love how you're talking about anchoring in the present and having that massively powerful, exciting future ahead of you that gives you purpose. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think the psychological way of looking at that is, and it's kind of, it's, it's, it can sound cliche, but like hope, literally hope is as fundamental as gratitude. Like from a psychological standpoint, hope is as fundamental as gratitude. It is. Yeah. Think about it. Think if you had no hope, literally. Think if your view of the future was completely, utterly hopeless Oof. and bleak. What would that do to your present? You would be. Oh, yeah. You would be completely washed. Like, yeah. and so hope is actually, and and hope is very convicted from a psychological standpoint. It's very powerful. It's not just like, oh, I hope this happens. It's like, no, hope is you're committed you have clear goals, you're willing to change and adjust and find how to get where you want to go. And you believe you have agency, meaning you take full responsibility for what happens. Um, but hope at the core is actually the anchor of your life. It's the anchor of your present. Uh, and without that, you know, you can't have grit, you can't have motivation, you can't move forward. I love it. I love it. All right. So our time is almost up. And one of the last things that we wanted to touch upon really quickly was the difference between an event that is motivational versus an event that is transformational. And we've got the E3 Success Summit coming up. It's going to be January the 13th through the 15th. Um, we have a ton of people that are on this call right now that are going to be there. We've got hundreds more that have already purchased tickets. They're excited to be there in that environment uh, to hopefully meet people in that top five or that top 10. Mm -hmm. They want to hear you speak. They're excited about that. 
Can you chat just briefly on how motivation isn't necessarily the answer? I mean, you get motivated, it feels good, and then it kind of dissipates. Whereas if you can go to an event where you can leave transformed and that that future self can actually become a reality and that purpose can become identified, like how much more powerful that is going to be than just getting pumped up for a weekend and going back home. Yeah, I equate it honestly to reading a book. So like a couple of days ago, I was reading a book and I was so shocked by what I was reading that I immediately acted on it. And, and I, going back to like flow, high consequence, if you're not immediately translating it to high, con- like to change, right? So like, let's, like in this call, if you don't immediately take this and go get a who or do something high stakes, that's going to get the pop you negative, like some serious feedback and maybe then maybe you'll be motivated. But I think that you got to really be a, a, an absorber, a learner, like, you know, and what that means is it's just that you're receptive and that you want to be transformed and that you're committed to becoming your future self. You're committed to no longer avoiding the truth, but facing it full on. Um, and what that means is you're willing to commit. You're willing to take the repercussions of whatever, whatever that means. And you move forward. And I think if you do that, it's, it's amazing what happens when you go into a, a transformational learning environment and you're a sponge and you actually absorb it. You go out a different person. Yes. How you do anything is how you do everything. And so you start doing, you start changing your model and your filter for everything and things that were once your standard no longer are because now your standard just went way up here and you're like, okay, I can't do this stuff anymore. And you, you genuinely start making the adjustments and uh, it. it's, it's, uh, Nothing, you know, I love the quote, nothing happens until after you commit, but also um, you don't really know what freedom feels like until after you commit. Like once you make a full commitment and you become fully willing to deal with the consequences, then you actually know what freedom feels like because now you, you, you took, you, you, you're no longer hiding from it out of fear. Like, and it feels very powerful to actually be free um, and to actually watch yourself do the things you want to do fully regardless of the consequences, you're going to be all right. And you're no longer living out of fear. And then on the other side of that, it's, it's just very empowering. I love it. You know, one of the things that we see at all of our events is that, you know, the personal life elevates, it lifts up their future self becomes a reality. And once that happens, it's like the business success catches up super fast. Right. You know, it's like, we're not that event that just teaches business concepts. And then you go home. It's like, wait a minute, we want you to be able to, you know, to have a bigger container. We want you to have a bigger capacity for success. So we lift you up, business stuff catches up and it's gonna be a home run. And um, we're excited to have you, man. This is gonna be really cool. I love it. Yeah, one just last comment on what you said. There's there's one last thing and I'll say it and I'll bounce off. Um, Is um, one of my favorite ideas in psychology is called psychological flexibility. Uh, obviously you want to become flexible rather than rigid, right? Mentally and emotionally. But a key aspect of this, which is what you just said is, is that in order to be really flexible, you, you actually don't want to view yourself as content. You actually want to view yourself as a context and the context constantly changed that idea of the container changes. And when you do that, you don't over identify with your thoughts and feelings because those are not you. Those are inside of you. You're actually the context of those things. And so when you go to events like this, the context, which is you dramatically expands and changes. And, uh, it's, it's just very, it it allows you to just, you know, be way more flexible in who you can be and what you can do rather than getting rigid, which is obviously a big aspect of upgrading your identity and becoming your future self. So very excited for, for this event. Everybody that's watching right now, if you're pumped to see Dr. Ben Hardy, in January on the stage at E3. Let's get a big Y-E-S going in that chat section. And Ben, where can people connect with you? How can they follow you? And also, when is that new book coming out? What's that ETA looking like? Uh, 10X comes out in May. Uh, And I think that there should be another one coming out next October. So if we were talking in a year from now, hopefully there's two more. But um, yeah, 10X comes out next May. Um, But uh, I'll get you guys. Uh, The final draft will be done in about, a month and so I'll, I'll for sure get that to you guys and you rock who knows maybe we maybe you could gamify it and share it with some of your people privately we'll see oh check that out, check that out. <laughs> what's the best way that they can follow you right now uh i would just say you know benjaminhardy.com is kind of the base and uh just check out the book you know there's the new one check out future self if you haven't read it and that's pretty much it 
I love it. Well, Wonderful. thank you so much for being here with us. We absolutely got a ton out of this interview. We cannot wait to see you in January. And I know I'm speaking on behalf of myself, the whole team here. You know, we love you, man. And your work is changing lives, which helps us change lives, which helps our members change kids' lives. So it's a big circle. We appreciate you for that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, that's it for today. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin Hardy, for being on the line with us. We'll see you very, very soon. This replay will be posted tomorrow. And of course, if you have any questions, post them in our group. And if you're interested in saving your seats at the E3 Success Summit, go to e3successsummit.com. And um, we only have a couple hundred seats left. Like we've sold over 600 in the first four weeks. It sounds funny to be like, oh yeah, there's only a couple hundred seats that are left. Right, but that's because we've already sold hundreds of other seats, so <laughs> exactly. it's going to go quickly. It's going to be insane. So if you're there, if you want to transform your business and life, if you want to make more money and do it in a way that just aligns with your real goals as a human being, this is going to be a, uh, the event to be at. Yes. And I'm telling you right now, if you're in that seat, you're going to absolutely love it, and you're going to say to yourself, this is the best event I could have ever attended. All right, that's it for today. We'll see you guys soon. And... Uh, have an awesome day, guys. Change those lives.